name is Carrie Ayshide. I identify with the pronoun she, her. I am welcoming you to the webinar on intersection of substance use and housing. And we're excited to have you here and our lovely panelists to review um, and just share the information that they have with us. So go ahead and go next slide, please. First, a couple logistical things before we go ahead and get started. We do have closed captioning available for the presentation today. Um, there is a note in the chat box as well as click on the closed captioning button to um, get access to those for you today. We also will be utilizing the Q&A feature on here. So any questions that you have for our panelists as they review content, please feel free to put those in there. We will be holding Q&A at the end more formally and our panelists and myself as my colleagues will be reviewing um, questions as they come through. We will also be utilizing the chat feature and anything um, that you would like to share, prompt panelists uh, on myself, any tech issues, please feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, to get us started, please go ahead and let us know who's joining us today, where you're from, and really just a short um, why you wanted to attend this webinar today. Um, go ahead and go next slide, please. So today, um, our presentation is put on by our Freedom Network Training Institute team, as well as our Housing and Technical Assistance Project. This project is supported by OVC, the Office for Victims of Crime. We provide support and resources to service providers, such as yourselves, on understanding and connecting housing options for survivors of trafficking. We host quarterly webinars on topics on the intersection of housing and human trafficking, and we can provide one-on-one -on -one training and technical assistance to OVC grantees and their partners. We also have a resource library that everyone has access to, and on there we share fact sheets and webinar recordings that you can find at freedomnetworkusa.org. And we also have a listserv that you're able to sign up for to receive notifications and or different things that we create on our Freedom Network Training Institute team. Go ahead and go next slide, please. So without further ado, I would love to introduce you to our presenters today and the wonderful content that they will then be getting into. First, I will introduce Katie Spriggs. Katie has been with Eastern Panhandle Empowerment Center, EPEC for eight years and currently works as the executive director. EPEC is a dual program at the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia that serves victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and human trafficking. Welcome, Katie. Next, I would like to introduce Gabriela Zapata Alma. Gabriela is the Director of Policy and Practice on Domestic Violence and, sub and the Substance Use at the National Center on Domestic Violence, Trauma, and Mental Health, as well as a lecturer and director of the Alcohol and Other Counselor Training Program at the University of Chicago. Welcome, Gabriela. Go ahead and go into the next slide, please. So just a brief overview of today's session and what that will bring. Um, so we'll be talking about the intersections of substance use and housing services as it relate to survivors of human trafficking. We'll talk about practical examples of policies and procedures that include best practices when serving survivors with substance use concerns, as well as reviewing and discussing on navigating the housing system with survivors of human trafficking who also may be currently using substances or substance use concerns. And with that, I will be turning over to our panelist, Katie, and Katie will go ahead and get us started. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carrie. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. We're excited to be here. Um, I'm going to start just by talking a little bit about our program here at EPIC. Um, we are a dual program, and in West Virginia, that just means there are some programs that just serve domestic violence survivors and some that just serve sexual assault survivors, and there's some that do both. We do both. Uh, we serve the easternmost panhandle. It's three counties. It's rather small geographically, but um, Berkeley County is contained in there, which is the second most populated county and the highest growing population in West Virginia. So we are rural and um, we were founded in 1977 on the belief, vision and belief that every person has a right to be safe, empowered and free from violence and the fear of violence. That is our mission statement. Um, central to that belief, we seek to eliminate domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, dating violence, and human trafficking. And then we know that you cannot possibly address these victimizations without addressing um, related social problems that contribute to these, such as child abuse, substance use, sexism, racism, and other forms of oppression. 
Um, our mission is probably very similar to a lot of yours, protect victims, prevent violence, and empower survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and dating violence, and human trafficking. And then we do operate a 16-bed emergency shelter, as well as a rather new to us, um, eight to 12 unit long-term rapid rehousing. When we say long-term, it's three to three months to a year, depending on the need. Um, and then we do operate three outreach offices in three different counties. And then there is a link to our website if you'd like to check us out more. You can go get you know, the next slide and you're- Thanks, Katie. Um, thanks. Carrie for having us today to the Freedom Network USA for having us and thanks Alana for making sure that everything runs smoothly on the tech end. So I'm Gabriela Zapata Alma from the National Center on Domestic Violence, Trauma and Mental Health. We're a special issue resource center dedicated to addressing the intersections of domestic violence, substance use, mental health and trauma. And so here I wanted to share for just a moment our integrated framework that everything we do is rooted in survivor defined approaches, relationship and connection, physical and emotional safety and hope and resilience. And then through that, we're able to then use empowerment based approaches, trauma informed approaches, approaches that are rooted in human rights and social justice and have an awareness and responsiveness to cultural and community and historical historical context. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. We're so excited to jump into the material and share um, some information with y'all. Oh, and I also wanted to share that we are headquartered in Chicago. And so I'm calling in from Chicago today and I am on unceded land of the Council of the Three Fires. If you are aware of the original caretakers of the land that you are on, I invite everyone to go ahead and put that in the chat. And now back to Katie. Awesome. Thank you, Gabriella. So we wanted to start you guys off by just a little, a little bit of um, a little bit of some brainstorming here. So think of a situation that involves substance use and housing. Um, and that situation feels challenging to you. And then we're gonna give you the ability to anonymously um, write it on this site. So hold for it is in the chat. So you're going to click that link and then you can anonymously submit your situation that feels challenging. Remember, it relates to housing and substance use. So we'll give you a second. For everyone, you might have to scroll up in the chat if you didn't catch it. It is up there. And I'll put it in again too. Okay. All right. Thanks, folks. Thank you. And I'm sure those will continue to roll in. And uh, we will revisit. <clears throat> So the, we wanted to also start by talking about the actual relationship between human trafficking and substance use. How do they, how do they co-occur? How are they related to each other? Um, tying in mental health and trauma as well. So we know that um, using substances when experiencing trauma like human trafficking can sometimes be a coping mechanism, right? Like the substance use was started to cope with the violence or the trauma that a person has um, experienced. And I think that's often the framework that is presented to us, um, to us in when we talk about trauma, right? We talk about it as a coping mechanism. But I think when you're working with human trafficking survivors, there's another approach as it could also be a method of control. So you want to also focus on the fact that the trafficker might have used um, substances to, to control the victim or to keep to maintain power and control over the survivor kind of as they were moving through the trafficking situation. And then even when the trafficking situation might be over, that could still be a method of maintaining control um, or mo even moving into a coping mechanism at that point. You can go forward, Gabrielle. So a lot of complex connections between substance use and human trafficking. And feel free to add in the chat some additional complex connections that you have um, noticed and that survivors have shared with you. So taking a look at the research, and certainly more information is needed, but some themes that have been found is that substances are commonly used by traffickers to entrap survivors, and that many survivors report being forced or coerced to use substances 
substances uh, by the traffickers as a form of control. At the same time, substances can be a form of coping with the traumatic effects of trafficking and any other potential lifetime trauma or childhood adversity that a person may have experienced. Um, so there was a study done by Reed and all, and they looked at um, a hundreds and hundreds of different uh, individual situations and experiences of trafficking. And what they found was that there was kind of six major, um, you can call them kind of profiles or scenarios that were very common among people who have experienced trafficking. And that four out of those six were associated with heavy use of alcohol and other substances. And so sometimes we can feel like you know, the substance use is something extra or is something that, you know, oh, I'm not an expert in and they need to talk to someone else about. But when we can recognize these complex connections, we can start to see that, you know, our, our services may be siloed, but people don't have siloed lives. And so we really do need to be able to have approaches that are accessible and are trauma informed, and of course, are rooted in voluntary services. And we'll talk all about that in the next you know, hour plus. Back to you, Katie. So um, as Gabriella mentioned, right now we've recognized that you know, substance use is our work when we're, when we're serving survivors of human trafficking, whether that's in our shelter, in an outreach program, in a rapid rehousing program, it all intersects. So what are some things that could get in the way of our intentions to do, to do this work? So um, stigma, some stigma that we've heard. If you, and if, when I'm going through these things, if you think of an example where you're like, yep, that, you know, I've seen that, I've observed that in my professional life, I've experienced it myself, feel free to put it in the chat um, and just kind of make note of it as you go through um, your own experiences. Um, what if you, let's say last week, just were working in your in the shelter with a survivor of human trafficking who um, may have recounted um, some child abuse or something like that, and you're already sort of in that headspace, it might be hard to then revisit it with another client and leave what you experienced behind and see this new person as a new whole person. So kind of staying cognizant of that, of some things that you might bring. Um, and not maybe not being aware of policies or practices, whether that's at the federal level, state level, your own agency, or if you are aware of them, it seems like a foreign policy, you're not really sure how to work through it or enact it and what that could look like. Um, and just simply not knowing what might be helpful to this person in this situation. So kind of think through those as, as barriers to being intentional with survivors. And then feel free to kind of add to that list as you go through, but really being aware of of barriers can certainly be beneficial. And then of course, um, we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. So that's good to remember when you're thinking about intentional behaviors. Okay, so we're gonna do um, a little exercise and this is definitely easier done in person, but we're gonna make it work via Zoom. So you're gonna utilize the chat. So what I want you to do, this is called logic versus impulse. So what we're gonna walk through is a scenario that I want you to pretend in your mind like it's happening to you right now as you are the human being that you are. So um, you're gonna be doing this, pretend you're off the clock. This is not something you're gonna travel and you're traveling on personal time, not company time. So, um, we're, so here's what I want you to do in the chat. Pretend, or you can even do it if you want. If you're in your office and you're tired of sitting all day, go ahead and stand up. And so in the chat, you are standing up as you are. If I'm gonna, I'm gonna present a scenario to you. And if you think that you would respond to that scenario, you yourself, if you would respond with impulse, meaning I'm not, I'm not talking that you instantly get, you know, no, no violence needs to be included in impulse. Just if you're responding with impulse, your first reaction, um, whether your reaction is to leave, is to quit doing what you're doing, is to give up on, on the scenario altogether, whatever impulse you might feel led to do, if you're going to reply with impulse, you're going to sit down, whether that's metaphorically or in the chat. 
Um, if you think, okay, I'm going to handle this situation logically, meaning you pause, take a second, evaluate your options, and then act, you're going to stay standing. So the minute you sit down, you're going to put in the chat, I sat down, sitting down, something to indicate that you're down. If you're staying standing, you just stay standing. Once you sit down, you stay seated. Um, there is no winner or loser. There's no right or wrong way. Please know that. So the scenario starts um, with you yourself traveling for personal reasons on an airplane. So you're going to the airport. I pause because sometimes people are out already. <laughs> They're like, I oh, nope, I'm not doing that. I impulsively refuse to go to the airport, right? right? Some people are already over it. All right, I can see everyone's still standing. Good job. We're all very patient with airport. You're by yourself, by the way. You're traveling alone um, with, the, with the knowledge that there is someone to receive you on the other side. So you do, you're going to someone else. So um, you arrive at the airport, you get to your, you know, gate, um, ready to depart, you made it through security, all those things, and they call your boarding pass and you get up to get on the airplane to arrive and have the flight attendant tell you that you actually were bumped from this flight. How we doing? All right, everyone's still, good job, everyone's still standing. Oh, some people are sitting. Okay, uh, it's okay. I, <laughs> Gabrielle is already sitting. Um, okay, so um, all right, for the rest of us, we're moving on. All right, so you're like, okay, fine, I will wait on the next plane. And they say, the next flight is 12 hours from now. So now you have a 12 hour wait. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, some people are, all right, more people sitting on this one. All right, so for those of us who are still standing, um, you spend your 12 hours in the airport, you waited, you're exhausted, whatever. You go to board the flight and you're told, oh, we didn't actually have enough room for you. You got to wait a little bit longer. It's going to be eight hours longer. Okay, more people down. It's all right, we're hanging in there. All right, so six more hours, eight more hours goes by. You finally board the plane. How exciting. This is wonderful. So you're on the plane. You get to the other side 18 hours late. And upon arrival, you go to baggage claim. And what do you think is not there at baggage claim? Baggage is gone. Somebody just put in the chat in all caps, done. Somebody else is sitting and crying. That's That would be me. I would be the sitting and crying. So with no solutions. So, um, okay, but we're still, let's, for those of us who might still be, somebody's walking away. If you're still standing at this point, our next step is that we then go to the baggage claim people and we tell them our baggage is missing. And they say, okay, hold on, let's figure it out. And you wait another four hours. At this point, you're afraid to leave the airport because you don't know really what's going on. Four hours later, they find your bag. This is exciting, right? And you get it back and it's damaged and part of your, um, your supplies in your bag is missing. Wow, everyone's, everyone's, sat, or everyone's already sitting. I'm not really sure. So, um, all right, the last one. So you get your bag, it's damaged, missing stuff. You're like, okay, clearly my bag is damaged and it's missing stuff. Like, what do you baggage people, like what is, you know, what's the airline gonna do about this? And the airline um, employee shuts the little gate thing so that you can no longer talk to them. And you're left standing there at the baggage claim area. Okay, people are starting to sit. Okay, so now, like, let's lower everyone's blood pressure. That's over, hypothetical. Um, let's pretend that in the perfect world, this person gets their baggage and it's all wonderful. Okay, tell me, how are you feeling in the chat? If you had to summarize it after this, ex this hypothetical experience. Frustrated, frustrated, anxious, annoyed, someone said cussing, fuming, exhausted, mad, a, a highest adrenaline, someone's still trying to fix it, someone else is ready for a new vacation. Oh, okay, so what I want you to do, uh, what would you want the people that were around you to do? to help you in this in this circumstance, like uh, just an eyewitness, somebody watching, or, or someone that worked for the airline at this point, what would you want them to do? Comfort, reassure me, support me, ask how they could help, listen, give you a clear explanation, validate your feeling, help you problem solve. Okay, acknowledge what happened. Um, would you, what would help you feel supported right now? Somebody said give up their seat. Listening to me, 
Mm -hmm. What would you not want people to do at this point? Or even if you were telling this story to your loved one on the other end, what would you not want them to do? Ignore you, tell me how I'm feeling, laugh at me, minimize it, blame me, resolve the problem for me, tell me it's not a big deal, dismiss it. Okay, so you can probably see where we're going with this at this point, but let's draw the conclusion. So the idea of this exercise is to get you to the point where you're not functioning at, at your highest standard, right? You're functioning on impulse because so many things have happened in such a short amount of time that it's hard for anyone to process it, right? Um, so that's often the, 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 the sort of brain space that survivors might be living in, right? It's really hard to process this information. Um, all they, they may have just recently come into the shelter, all of it's brand new. Um, and you say as, a, as an advocate, you have you know five days to start working on your goals. That could be incredibly overwhelming, right? So what I want you to think about as we continue to move through is what you said would be helpful compared to what you said would not be helpful. And how would you want someone to react to a situation where you were frustrated, ready to give up, never going to fly again, right? All of those things. You can go to the next slide. Okay. So when you're thinking about about your own practice, start thinking about what experiences have influenced your own personal view on substance use and people who use substances, and then how are those views showing up in your advocacy, in your everyday practice, right? Um, so we just want you to kind of think about that as we're moving through and as you're moving through serving survivors every day. You can go to the next one. And then, so think about those last questions and then think about the, these questions. And I want you to go ahead and put some answers in the chat if you want. If you're thinking about something and you're kind of processing it, feel free to. Um, how does stigma and discrimination against people who use substances show up in our services? So do you screen out at intake for substance use disorder? Do you ask that question? And if you do ask it, I want you right now to think about why. Why are you asking it? Are you asking it because you're thinking about the resources you could connect this person to? Or are you asking it because you're thinking about, oh my gosh, the last time someone told me they used substances and came into the shelter, it you know ended badly. Do I really wanna do that again, right? Um, so somebody said forcing mandatory drug tests in shelter. Yeah, we're gonna talk about those more later, but so certainly. Um, are you asking the question to ask people to leave? Um, how can we enhance safety and equity for all survivors, no matter what they're presenting with at the time, right? And please know that I'm in direct practice right now. We are running an organization right now. I know that this is not easy. I know that it's, you log on here and you're like, oh my gosh, these things are so great. And then when you put them into practice, they're very complex and they're very centered around each person. And it really, you really have to do this reflective practice with yourself for every single case. Like when Grab Gabrielle and I were preparing for this, I was telling her we had a particularly difficult client at the time. And a, and a method that I had to use in my own reflective practice was that when an advocate brought me an, an issue with this client or a thought or, or even an approach with this client, I had to change who I was talking about in my mind because I had so many previous experiences with this person that I had to do everything I could to not let that those experiences interact with what's going on right now. I'm what this client needs right now and how they're presenting right now. You can go to the next slide. So then the other thing we want you to think through, um, what are our values and intentions when it comes to supporting survivors who use substances? And, and keywords, supporting the survivor who uses substances, right? How are we doing that? And then I think we wanted to put a question in the chat with this one, Gabriella. Do you want me to put it in? Yeah. So we're going to put, oh, I can do chat. it. You keep, you keep talking. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll read it out loud while you type it. How about that? <laughs> um, so the question will be spoiler alert. Um, what are some concerns that you have about serving survivors who are actively using substances in your housing program, whether that's a shelter, whether that's rapid rehousing, temporary housing, whatever that might be, give us some concerns that you have. Harming one of the children came out. 
All right, we're going to talk through that. How a lot about children using a loan. That was an interesting one. We can talk about harm reduction tactics, neglecting their children. What if they overdose? And again, we'll talk about harm reduction, triggering others in recovery. All right, I'm glad someone brought that up. This came up for us. I guess like two years ago. And what we found to be very helpful as, as just a tip is we incorporated two separate groups in the shelter. Um, they sort of disbanded when COVID started because we weren't really doing groups. But we are hoping to get them back. We had one that was for individuals who were actively using and they could enroll themselves. It was not mandatory. They could come if they wanted to. And then we had one that was for people who are in active recovery. Um, to really support, to help them feel supported, to help both parties feel supported. We felt that that was very helpful. Concern is that they might not make it through the program, um, compromising others, losing grants. So that one we will talk about a little bit later too, but you're actually more likely to, grants actually require that you serve individuals regardless of their circumstances. Um, safety. We're going to talk about centering survivor safety rather than like our organization's idea of safety, a person's safety. All right, you can go on to the next one. Well, those will keep coming in, I'm sure. So some values to keep in mind. Um, each person's wholeness, seeing them as a whole human being. And again, we kind of talked about that, right? As a, as a whole product of who they are, not your experience with them before, not who the, their roommate told you they were, um, and not just parts of them as, as a human, right? We're looking at them as a whole person. Trauma-informed and culturally responsive support. So make sure that your staff or, or you yourself, if you're a direct service provider, is really um, doing the work it takes to provide culturally competent services. Um, preserve their dignity and choice um, in every way that you possibly can, right? There's some things that we can't choose. We can't allow, like for instance, our dishwasher repeatedly breaks. That's not a choice <laughs> that the survivors have. They're like, I really want the dishwasher to break today, right? Like that's not the approach. But um, what if the survivor said, I really hate doing dishes and I wish someone would help me with them? cool, we can help you with them, right? Like, or maybe another survivor would help you with them, or maybe your child, this could be a thing you do with your child. Like, you know, kind of see it as a skill building um, value, like that you're um, preserving their dignity and choice in every way that you can, even though there's some ways that we just can't help. Avoid harmonization at all levels. Um, at intake, from intake to the time they leave, intake to independent state, right? We're going to preserve, avoid re traumatization the whole way across the board. Be present and non judgmental. Um, judgment, we'll, we'll talk about, oh, let me, we'll talk about, um, some ways to really enact that kind of later. Remain connected and caring and start sensing in yourself when you're not feeling connected and then, and then talk with someone, talk with a coworker, talk with if you see a therapist, talk with your supervisor, um, access to services and make sure you have a no wrong door approach. It doesn't matter what avenue they take to get to whatever the, it is, you respect that and acknowledge how brave and awesome that was. And I think Gabriella, you're up next. Yeah, thanks so much, Katie. So now we're gonna talk about substance use. Um, and here I have a photo and the what the person wrote on their card is, I challenge stigma by knowing the facts. So much of understanding substance use is unlearning the societal stigma that surrounds us. So first recognizing that there is a spectrum of substance use, that um, there is all the way from non-use to beneficial use, casual or non-problematic use, then use that starts to pose some risk to either the person themselves or potentially um, those around them, and then all the way to chaotic use, use that is no longer um, kind of within the person. It's really hard to make choices around that use. A lot of times um, we have been told that all substance use is on this chronic dependence scale. We've also, and that's not the case, um, about 89% of people who use substances actually do so in ways that are either non-problematic or even um, potentially beneficial. And then um, 
So really only 10% of people who use substances experience potential risks or problems related to their substance use or, or pose any kind of risk to those around them. Something else that we've been told is that if somebody is experiencing chronic dependence, that the only answer is complete and total abstinence. And yet what we know is that that's not realistic for a whole lot of people. And it's also not aligned with our programming or with our funding when our funding talks about voluntary services and having accessible services. And so, one of the first things that we want to do in understanding substance use is understanding that a lot of what we might kind of take for granted or assume about substance use may have actually not been based in research or in evidence and maybe more so based or informed by societal stigma. So here is some evidence from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. They conduct an annual survey on substance use, substance use disorder, and mental health. And so the blue bar here is the use of an illicit substance in the past year. And the red bar is whether or not that person met criteria for a diagnosable substance use disorder in that past year. So right here, we see that the vast majority of people who have used an illicit substance in the past year did not do that in a way that met criteria for a substance use disorder. So this is important for a couple of reasons. One, to understand that not everyone who is using a substance even meets criteria for having a diagnosable substance use disorder. So we don't want to be assuming that people have a health condition just because they use a substance. Another reason this is important is that if our program is at all trying to steer people towards formal treatment, um, which of course is not aligned with voluntary services, but if we're trying to, you know, mandate or um, highly recommend or in any way tell people that they should be seeing a treatment provider, substance use disorder treatment is based on medical necessity. So somebody who doesn't meet criteria for a substance use disorder isn't eligible for formal treatment. And so if we're turning people away, um, we, we're going to give you some tools for what you can do instead, um, but recognize that that's another way that survivors end up kind of locked out of all these different siloed systems with no real access to help or services. So instead, we want to make room for the range, the diversity of experiences that for some people, diagnosis provides an understanding, it provides an explanation. When some, For some people, it can be incredibly grounding to have a sense of, I have a diagnosed health condition. For other people, diagnosis may feel judgmental, may feel like just another label, or may feel like it really misses the whole point of their experience and their context, right? And so we never want to pressure or force a diagnosis. We want to do actually quite the opposite in every case and find out from a survivor themselves what they would, what they would find helpful, right? How do they see their situation and what would be helpful in their situation? And by that same token, in really embracing the multiple pathways of recovery and healing. That for some people, recovery and healing is something that they find that formal treatment is important in that path. And there's also evidence to show that the vast majority of people who recover from a diagnosable substance use disorder do that without ever meeting a formal treatment provider. I know that when I was becoming trained as a treatment provider, I was like, what? What do you mean? <laughs> but the vast majority of people with a diagnosable substance use disorder heal and recover without ever going to treatment. And so if we are trying to really define somebody's recovery path, we're very likely doing more harm than good. Instead, we want to be able to embrace that recovery and healing happens through multiple um, paths and that people often use two or more different sources of support in their recovery and healing, and that that's largely shaped and informed by our culture 
and our positionality within our community context. And so part of having a culturally responsive approach is also um, being able to embrace multiple pathways. I've known folks that, you know, have named that their healing happened in social action, that their healing happened in activism, that their healing happened in mutual aid, that, um, that actually they had been kicked out of treatment countless times, that treatment was harmful for them. And that's a whole nother set of concerns that we need to address with this accessibility in treatment systems. Um, but we really want to break out of this assumption that people either qualify for or need treatment or that treatment would, would be the only way um, for somebody to get some support. And just for time, I'm going to keep moving forward. So when we're breaking out of these kind of all or nothing ways of thinking, what we can do is actually use this framework called drug set and setting. And as we are, you know, partnering with survivors to, to try to understand their substance use, um, we can be listening for these different parts of their substance use experience. And I want to be clear that we would never force these conversations. This is when we've built the safety for survivors to be sharing these parts of it, their experience with us. So first is the drug, the substance itself, how we get the substance into our body, um, how much we use, and ultimately what it's doing in our body and in our brain. Now, the drug itself, or the drug kind of slice of this pie, can um, some of the so an example of how that can change our substance use experience. Um, you know, I'm going to have a very different experience, or a person is going to have a very different experience if they have. Uh, let's say one beer versus 12 beers, right? Those are very different experiences for people. And so something as people start to listen for these different segments, it naturally puts us in a non-judgmental space, in a strength-based space, and that any small change in any one of these areas, and of course, any change would be survivor-led and survivor-defined, but any small change in any one of these areas can have large ripple effects in increasing safety um, within that survivor substance use experience. So the set part speaks to everything that is happening inside of the person. So our mindset, um, what we're expecting from the substance use experience, how we feel um, before using, right? Am I using because I'm feeling really lonely? Am I using because I'm feeling really anxious? Um, or maybe I'm feeling really numb and that's why I'm using. Or am I using because I'm celebrating, right? That all of these are gonna have a, are gonna have um, a really different effect on how we experience that substance use. This also includes our physical health, um, both health conditions, as well as whether we've eaten that day, whether we slept that night, um, and what quality of sleep we're having. And so, you know, using that same example of alcohol use, a person's experience of alcohol use is going to be very different if they have, let's say, um, skipped dinner by accident versus they are having a serving of alcohol, um, let's say, with dinner, right? Those tend to be very different experiences. And then the setting is everything around us, our environment, our context. So this is the, um, you know, where we're getting our substances from, where we're storing them, where we are when we're using, um, where we are when we're recovering from use, who's around us, um, as well as some of our social and cultural kind of factors and how substance use is kind of seen within the, our environment and our um, society. And so the experience of somebody using cannabis, let's say, for example, in a location where cannabis use is legal, can differ from somebody who is using cannabis in a location where it is not considered legal. Um, another something to, a couple things I want to highlight here when it comes to setting and set is that when somebody is using and they need to hide their use in their environment, that leads to much more chaotic use and much more potentially dangerous substance use experiences. And for set, when there is shame and guilt driving some of that use, which is very common, obviously, is an effective trauma, um, that can also lead to more um, 
more chaotic and dangerous and negative substance use experiences. So these are other reasons why it becomes really important for us to address any of that stigma within our own program settings, because we can be feeding the kind of chaos and the danger that a person is facing. So we are running just a tad behind time. So I'm going to skip this scenario, but you will have a copy of the slides. So you can go back and just read through the scenario, practice just thinking about drug set and setting. And then on the next slide, you have it highlighted in the different areas. And it's just meant to kind of practice using this framework. And we've heard from a lot of programs that as they apply this framework, it just really takes them out of that judgmental space and into that kind of alignment with a survivor. So if it is safe for someone to talk about their substance use in our program, and what I mean by that is that they're not going to be judged, they're not going to be kicked out, they're not going to be, um, you know, now every time that there's a problem, they're not going to be scapegoated with it. So if it is truly safe for someone to talk about their substance use with us, here are some different conversation starters. Um, and what you'll notice about some of these is that some of them end in a question and some of them don't. Some, so so for example, I'll read one out loud that doesn't end with a question. Many people have shared with us that they were coerced into doing something illegal or other things they felt uncomfortable with in order to get alcohol or other drugs. This is a way that substances can be used as a tactic of control. If this is something you've been through, know it isn't your fault and we're here to support you. So it can be really powerful to just kind of put some information out there and let the person know that we're here to support them and that it's not their fault, they're not alone. And then just leave the ball in their court, you know, so that they have the agency, they are the ones who are empowered to then come to us when and if they feel like we're a safe support to talk about their substance use or their experiences with substances in general. And consent is really important. So unless somebody has specifically asked us for substance use resources, or unless somebody has specifically asked us to talk about substance use with them, it's really important for us to ask permission before we ask any follow-up questions. That can be as simple as, would it be all right if we took a moment to talk a little more about substance use right now? Um, or before we offer information or feedback related to substance use. And that can be as simple as, I have some information you might find useful. Would it be all right to go over it together? And if and when the person declines, we really need to respect that now. It is crucial that we respect that now. Um, that people need to be able to set a boundary with us before they can ever feel safe to invite us in to this part of their life, right? And in general, before they can feel safe to invite us in. So I often say people need to be able to push us away before they can invite us in. So here, some ways that we could respond, um, thanking them, letting, you know, thank Thanks for letting me know. It's important that our it's important to me that our time together focuses on what you find important and helpful. Would it be all right if I checked in with you about this in the future? And if still no, letting them know we hear them loud and clear, right? And that the ball is in their court, that they are welcome to bring this up with us in the future. Now I know having myself worked in housing for over a decade, that there are probably folks who are wondering like, well, what do I do if we have to talk about it? Because there are situations happening and we have to be able to talk about the substance use, right? And so to talk more about that, we're actually going to, I'm gonna turn it back to Katie to focus on substance use and housing. Thanks, that was great. Yeah, so now we're gonna move into talking about the intersection of substance use and housing when they're occurring at the same time. Uh, and keep in mind, this could be your shelter, your emergency shelter, your you know housing programs, whatever you might be operating. Um, you can go to the next slide. So we okay, have, so what, oh, sorry, I'm just gonna ask Alana real quick to launch the poll. 
Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Perfect time. So the poll question you're answering is, are programs are safer when survivors are screened out for substance use and must hide or deny, deny use, or when survivors are able to talk with staff and safety plan around their substance use? Well, it seems to be substantially <laughs> One answer so far. So the everyone who participated actually said that our programs are safer when survivors are able to talk with staff and safety plan around substance use. Happy to see those results. So we're going to move into putting that into practice a little bit. You can go to the next one. So what we found when we look at voluntary services and substance use disorder treatment is that in two-year outcomes, it was found that people in housing programs didn't require abstinence from, who, who didn't require abstinence from substances were more likely to engage in substance use disorder treatment and did not use more substances. So again, to, to kind of break that down, when someone was enrolled in a program that did not require them to A, hide that they were using substances or felt ashamed, um, and were not required to completely stop using substances in order to access the program, they were actually more likely um, to engage in substance use disorder treatment and did not use more substances compared to those that were required to completely stop using. Um, so I don't know, there's an interesting, an interesting article anyone in the DV world might have seen. It's called How the Earth Didn't Fly Into the Sun. Um, it's talk, it talks, talks about breaking down rules in domestic violence shelters, which is very similar, um, which will, you know, we'll sort of talk about how rules can be used against survivors a little later too. Um, but it, the same sort of studies were found that if the program adapted um, its services to the, the actual needs of survivors as a whole human, um, survivor success was more easily accomplished and accomplished in a shorter amount of time and accomplished in partnership with the program rather than like sort of working against the program. Um, so you can go to the next one. And what we know, anyone who does housing work knows that housing is healing um, and people are more likely to remain stably housed. Um, and cease using substances when programs use person-centered and non-judgmental approaches. So that's how, that's individualizing services to the person rather than having just like a flat policy. Um, have you ever heard the phrase reactionary policies? Um, we really don't love those. Um, they're not very survivor-centered. That's where the program creates an entire policy around one single situation. So. Um, one client, I'm trying to think of something that actually occurs within the shelter. Oh, for, okay, for, this is a perfect example. One client, um, an advocate walked out on the porch at 11.07 p.m. at night and caught them, saw them smoking marijuana. In West Virginia, it's still not legal. So, um, for, so here, that would be, you know, a thing. So the new policy is no one's allowed on the porch after 11 p.m., right? Is that helping anyone? <laughs> No, and did we even really do we even really have a real conversation with the survivor around what's going on? Um, is it the porch's fault that this is occurring, right? So no one gets to go outside anymore because of this. Like that's a reactionary policy. So rather than that, you're looking at individualized treatment plans, right? Uh, when pro so survivors are more likely to remain stably housed when programs made services available that provide information and, and resources, which I, Gabriella touched on that a little bit earlier, how beneficial just simple education can be, right? Um, and just having visible resources and, and conversations. And when programs actively engage people um, in conversations around substance use, which we sort of talked about a little bit too. Um, you can go to the next one. Thanks, Katie. So one of the reasons why we see substance use um, kind of healing occurring without really taking substance use head on is because of something known as recovery capital. So recovery capital is all of the internal and external resources that a person has access to that helps them in their journey of recovery. 
And so rather than trying to, you know, take substance use head on, while we certainly want to be cultivating programs where people can safely share their experiences of substance use with us, that people can have access to our programs, and that if and when somebody uh, wants access to a substance use resource, whether that be treatment or mutual aid or harm reduction organizations, that we're able to make those active service connections. So on top of all of that, we want to be able to really support people in developing their recovery capital because this is going to really and kind of naturally support people as they seek to make better, just to have more decision-making power over their own substance use. Nobody wants to feel like they're in chaotic substance use, right? So really aligning with folks and helping them access the resources that aid them in their journey. So in this model, there are four main categories of recovery capital. And I want you to start thinking about what do our services already do to support these different areas of recovery capital. So there's the physical domain, there's the, um, which is like our physical health, safe shelter, our basic needs, our financial resources. There's the human domain, which are things like our skill, our hopefulness, um, our ability to set our own goals, as well as our core values. There's the whole social domain, um, connection with family, with safe, intimate relationships, relationships of kinship, as well as just broader social support and peer-based support. And then our connection with the larger community, that there are that we're in an anti-stigma community, that there are recovery role models. Um, so role models that talk openly about their life of recovery and that that is in multiple different ways that recovery shows up, not just abstinence only based recovery. And that there are peer led support groups as well. So I'm actually, we had a jam board here. I'm actually gonna skip it for time just because we are a little bit behind. And I wanna invite everyone, we're at a, roughly a midway point, um, to follow along with this mind-body practice. You know, when we can recognize that many times people are using substances to feel better, to feel a sense of connection with themselves, potentially to feel a sense of connection with others, that when we can share mind-body practices, if people are interested, of course, that this can have a really um, multiple different kinds of positive effects for folks. And people can feel like they have another tool in their toolbox around some of that um, coping, especially. So this comes from emotional freedom techniques, and um, this specific kind of image comes from Capacitar, which has a manual in multiple languages on healing trauma and empowering wellness. And they've done a lot of work with, um, with community-based trauma uh, and disaster relief. So what you see here um, is first you need to find a field with horses and rainbows. You got that field? Just kidding. So um, what you see here is an image of the human form and some different points and numbers that we're gonna go through in order. I will lead folks through that. Um, I wanna invite everyone to go ahead and join your fingertips. And then and you're welcome to move around, stand up, whatever feels good for you or remain um, seated or lie down, whatever feels good for you. Um, and go ahead and just tap lightly on the inside of your eyebrows, so on your forehead, just above where your eyebrows uh, come together. And then we're going to move to the outside of the eyebrows, kind of like the temples. And then we're going to move to our cheekbones, just right underneath our eyes, lightly tapping. And then this is tricky. We're going to go to one hand, whichever hand you want. And we're going to tap with one hand just underneath our nose on our upper lip. Moving to the space between our lower lip and our chin.
Then we're gonna come back to two hands and tap just at our kind of upper ribs on our sides here. And then we're gonna move to kind of right below our collarbones. Then we're gonna hold out our left hand and tap right here on kind of the fleshy side of our hand beneath our pinky. And then the last part we're gonna do is we're gonna find our sore spot and rub it. There's a spot on your left upper chest that is actually a little bit sore if you rub it and it's only on this side. So we're gonna find that spot and just gently rub it in circular motions. Now I've used this to start groups, to end groups, to help people ground if they're, especially if they're experiencing any kind of trauma symptom or even potentially a flashback. And people have found it very, very helpful. This is also something that all of us can use as we're going through our day and really looking for some of that rooting and that grounding. Thanks everyone. I'm gonna hand it back to Katie now. That was great. That's the first time I've ever done that, but I loved it. Definitely gonna put that in the toolbox. So we're gonna move into practical strategies. Um, incorporating them in voluntary service model. What does that look like? Um, meeting the survivors that we serve where they are. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so again, I think in the in the you know um, focus of time, we will skip over our scenario with Evan. But you do have it. I do want you to read over it and consider the questions. Um, how would your program respond? How, how could your program respond differently? Uh, what could you do to support Evan or could you would help would help you better support Evan? Um, and I actually pulled this scenario from a real one that we went through here at Epic. So um, you'll be supplied with like our contact info. If you want to, you know, decompress over it, you're like, I've really been thinking about that. I want to talk about it. Feel free to reach out. You know what, Katie, um, I wonder if actually, since I skipped the other scenario, if maybe we, we should, have time? yeah, maybe let's go ahead and do this scenario just to make sure that we're talking about through application and we'll find somewhere else to kind of get a little time back. How does that sound? Perfect. This is a good one. So let's, I'll read it aloud, but while I'm reading, if you're a quick reader, if you've already read it, feel free to start kind of putting your thoughts in the chat. So Evan presents for services via your agency's hotline. Evan has been a longtime client of your organization and was exited from your residential program around three months ago after finding evidence of substance use in his room. When he left, he was angry at advocates and said he'd never be back. He reported to the hotline worker that the man he's been staying with had begun forcing him to earn his rent by trafficking Evan with his friends. Last night, one of these friends strangled Evan and he believes that the trafficker has followed him to his friend's house where he's calling from. That's where he's calling you from, the friend's house. So let's start with how would your program respond as it is right now? Give me some response suggestions. Who would allow Evan to come, safety planning in all caps, good point. Who would allow Evan to come back into the residential program? Okay, so someone said call 911. Would you do that without Evan's permission? He didn't call 911, he called your hotline, right? So would we automatically involve the criminal justice system? Somebody said allowing him back with a safety plan. Somebody said it would be conditional that he has to attend group. Go ahead, Gabriella. Yeah, and I want to point out here, um, Shirley wrote, first apologize to him for how he was previously treated. It's pretty powerful. I love that. Really honoring people's humanity first. So a lot of people have said safety planning, thank him for reaching out. It was a good, a big step to reach out considering he was exited from the program before, right? So 
And what about if your program does multiple things? So let's say you have a residential program, you have an outreach program, you have um, multiple housing programs. So maybe you have a shelter, an emergency shelter, but you also have rapid rehousing. When someone maybe didn't work out in the, in the sheltering program, in the emergency shelter, are they then excluded from other services, right? So has Evan been getting outreach services since the exit from the residential program, right? Um, ask if assess for the safety right now um, provide support services, a system to where he feels safe. What resources would you need or do you already have that you're thinking of that would help you better support Evan? We're gonna provide some in the end, spoiler alert. Um, having a specific human trafficking advocate, I'm glad someone pointed that out. Specialized advocates can be very helpful in situations like this. Um, providing a opportunity. Mm -hmm. So in our case, when this person came back, um, when and obviously I, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, details of the scenario were drastically changed to the point where no confidential or personally identifiable information was presented. Um, but just to, to note, when Evan, hypothetical Evan, was welcomed back into the program, so interestingly enough, um, by allowing space to talk openly about what Evan's experience, about his substance use, about you know what has happened in three months, um, Evan was actually able to um, enter their own healing through without using medical resources, which is a great point, um, through this this time in the program. So I think seeing so seeing Evan as a as a new human being, um, as a product of what, of him as himself as a whole person, uh, would be very beneficial if in this sort of scenario. Um, finding housing is a constant problem. Yep, I feel that. All right, we will continue to think about Evan as we move forward. And oh, into stages of change. That was a perfect. Yeah, so stages of change. And let me know in the chat if this is something you're familiar with. But this is based on research by Prochaska, DiClemente, and Norcross on how people tend to change, how people tend to experience um, their relationship with substances. And this is a really helpful piece in understanding how we can truly meet people where they are and what would be helpful for them based on where they are in their relationship to substance use. Um, now that said, sometimes people apply stages of change to other things like um, either a relationship or you know, engagement in transactional sex or things like that. And our center cautions against that kind of use. So we don't think that stages of change was developed on that, re on that research, it wasn't. Um, and so that's a misapplication of stages of change but it's something that can be really helpful specifically around substance use. So I'll do a real short and sweet here. Pre-contemplation is there are some risks and problems related to substance use, but the individual doesn't see it as a risk or a problem. Or if they, if they do see some of the problems related to their substance use, they feel really hopeless about it. Like no matter what they do, they can't change it. Contemplation is I'm starting to think about this. Is this a problem? Are there some parts of this that aren't working for me? Are there some parts of this that maybe helped me before but aren't helping me anymore? They're actually a barrier to me now. So that's where I'm thinking about it, but I haven't made a decision yet. Once I make a decision for some kind of change, and that doesn't necessarily mean stop using substances, that could mean just any positive change as the person defines it for themselves. Now I've entered a preparation stage where I'm thinking about what are some of the resources that I um, would be helpful in this? How am I gonna plan going around, going about this change, um, you know, and, and just, what what's my plan here and it's even better to have a plan a plan b plan c right i have kind of multiple backup plans around this an action i'm taking action on my change plan but i'm still in that kind of early phase where i'm still still wobbly still figuring it out in the maintenance phase i'm now going from that early change to making this my new normal 
This is now becoming part of my way of being. And of course, there are some folks that will go into permanent exit where um, this has become so their, this change has become integrated into their new normal so much so that it really is effortless at this point. It doesn't take a whole lot of action on their part. And something else that was really important in this research was that experiencing setbacks in our goals is a part of the process and that it doesn't mean that we failed. It doesn't mean that all is lost. It doesn't mean that, um, that, you know, we, we are, uh, we can't do it right. That it's just part of the process of growth that just the same way when we are, um, learning to crawl and we fall on our bellies, right? It doesn't mean that we failed to learn to crawl. That means that that's actually part of the process. And so understanding that setbacks aren't failures, they aren't, and they aren't mistakes, that they're actually moments for us to learn from, to understand maybe what was missing from our change plan, what other resources needed, what situation came up that I, you know, hadn't thought about, hadn't kind of planned for yet. And so one of the handouts that you'll receive is um, the different stages of change, what are some things that you might notice or the person might share with you that will give you kind of a, a little window into where they may be in their relationship with substances and then how we can show up, what we can do to offer relevant and responsive support. Um, so always building relationship and focusing on their self-defined needs and resources. Sometimes we can feel this pressure like, well, if I'm not talking about the substance use, then we're not doing anything about the substance use. So if you feel that way at any point, remember recovery capital. That when somebody who is feels hopeless about their substance use or feels like, you know, their substance use isn't a problem, but it's, you know, kind of causing some, some chaos in their lives or in, you know, lives around them, um, that really it's focusing on what they want to focus on is not only going to build their sense of emotional and physical safety, but it's also going to contribute to their recovery capital to have what they need to make meaningful changes as they define them. In contemplation, um, we want to use gentle curiosity and reflective listening. And here, we want to remain neutral regarding any kind of change. It can be a real temptation for us to pull out the pro cons sheet or to start, you know, trying to convince people everything they have to gain from change. Um, and if and when we do these things, we tend to just push people right back into pre-contemplation. So here we want to stay really, really neutral. Things like, huh, you know, well, if you were to make some kind of change, what do you see as the reasons for making change? Or you know, um, what are some things that would help you if you decided to go about it, right? Just some gentle curiosity and really staying focused on them and being empathetic. Now, when someone has um, made the decision for change, this is where it can be really helpful for us to get into that brainstorming, um, solution making, and then connecting people with resources. And if we want to do like a pro cons list around change, the preparation stage is the place to do it because someone's already decided at this point. So that can really help us understand what resources would be helpful. And then, and what barriers might exist that we need to help a person um, kind of address and advocate on their behalf. And then action, we tend to know what to do because typically our services are already built for action, right? Um, so we wanna affirm the person, we wanna to continue to check in with them. And then in maintenance, just helping them to maintain that long-term. And then if they do experience a setback, sometimes also called a lapse, we wanna be sure to provide emotional support and help neutralize any feelings of shame. And then from there, as we really provide that support, we reestablish that emotional and physical safety, um, we can just do a, a, we can offer, you know, would it be helpful to talk about what happened? Would it be helpful to 
think about what might be help, what would, what you might want to do differently or what resources would be helpful if you encountered something similar in the future, right? So we can kind of do that little pivot to that future oriented planning that is still with permission and that the person is naming what would be helpful in that moment. And if the person says no, then it's likely because that feels really shameful right now and they still need um, that sense of just uh, emotional safety and relationship and connection. And so something I want to um, kind of throw out there, I saw some different folks in the um, mention, you know, kind of signing a contract of no use. And so something that I'll say is that substance use behaviors are very complex. Um, sometimes it, people can be an autopilot, sometimes there is more choice involved, um, but there's a lot of different reasons why people may be using substances. And that if it were as simple as um, someone signing on a dotted line um, and me letting them know I don't approve of your use, then we would not have treatment systems. We would not be having this conversation. We would not have the needs that exist in our culture and our society, right? And so be careful of oversimplifying uh, substance use to just mean that, you know, to set up kind of ultimatums because we can be setting people up for failure. And what we're doing instead is what we are doing rather than supporting somebody in changing their substance use behavior if they want to change it, um, or rather than making our program safer, what we're doing instead is actually setting up a dynamic where they can't talk to us about their substance use, um, where they feel a lot of shame around their substance use, and where um, they feel a lot of pressure now. And we know that all of that pressure and stress can drive more chaotic substance use. So some additional pieces on supporting safety, um, having relationships that are characterized by support, trustworthiness, empathy, and acceptance. And that self-regulation are supported through a variety of methods, including having things like art supplies and mind-body practices and program space available where people can, you know, be in community, but also maybe like have some quiet space as well. Um, places, if there's a little carve out where people can kind of be outside, but still feel safe, things like that. Some emotional support planning and de-escalation that a lot of times situations get escalated because um, we're actually uh, reacting versus responding. And then we are reacting in ways that are really making somebody feel emotionally unsafe. Um, and so we need to be clear that substance use in and of itself doesn't equal violence um, and the importance of having trauma informed not only relationships, but spaces as well. And that regardless of whether or not anyone in our program is currently using substances, we still need to have effective crisis prevention and intervention protocols um, that you know, we can enter into crisis for any number of reasons. So we need to break away from this idea that substance use automatically means crisis. Um, for many people, that is just not the case at all. And that it really is um, the experiences of being judged, of being stigmatized, of being told that we can't be there anymore, that, you know, that all of having our rights taken away, that those are the things that are going to really push the crisis. Um, having safer bathrooms, and there is some guidance on that in a guide that I wrote called "Committed to All Committed to Safety for All Survivors," and so that's a link that we can share, and it's available on the center's website. Food access is really important. Food access can help with not only um, the kind of substance use, you know, experience, but also just a feeling of personal safety. And then of course, I saw a lot of folks mention in the chat, the fears around overdose. And overdose is a reality. We have been amidst an overdose epidemic and that has only increased in the past year. 
And so for overdose, we need to have, regardless of whether or not people are using substances in our program, we need to have established overdose prevention policies and protocol, including training and access to the opioid overdose antidote known as naloxone. Um, and that, you know, there's a lot of resources available on that. And you can also partner with local public health and harm reduction organizations to get that up and running in your program. And so we have 15 minutes left. <laughs> and so I do want to introduce this Jamboard. I'm going to copy this into the chat so folks have access to it. And when you go to this Jamboard, I'm going to switch my share to that real quick. And this is what is known as a start, stop, continue. And I see folks adding, you know, joining us. So what you can do if you haven't had a Jamboard before is that you can type here, you know, anything you want to type. So there are three different questions. What's one thing you want to start doing? So um, let's say like, you know, building safety for survivors to talk about their substance use, right? Let's say that. And then when you hit save, that comes up as a little as a little sticky. And then you can move it, you can make it bigger, you can hit these three dots and, you know, edit it. And then you click up here to go to the next question. What's one thing you want to stop doing? And then what's one thing that you already do that you want to be sure to continue doing? So we're going to let y'all just go ahead and play with that while we talk some more specifically about policies. And we'll come back to that at the end. And I'll hand it over to you, Katie. All right. So as Gabrielle said, we're going to start talking about policies that support practice when working with survivors in housing. Um, you can go to the next one. Hope you guys are enjoying the Jamboard. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, okay. So how do we build safety for survivors to be able to discuss their substance use with us? Um, so this is where you wanna start looking at your organization's policies and practices, um, specifically through the lens of how are you building safety for survivors to be able to talk about their substance use within the program? So are you, do you have policies and procedures that actively work against that goal? Um, do you have, like we talked about earlier, do you screen out? We're gonna talk about um, other, other policies or procedures that might, what about like room searches? Let's talk about how are those done? And we know, again, we've all done direct practice, right? We know that at times that might need to happen, but how can you create a system for a room search or a system for, um, oh, some people are having issues getting on the Jamboard, just warning you, it's in the, chat. Um, how, so for instance, if you, if you want, if you have to do room searches, right, if something occurs to where it has to be done, can it be something that survivors have input on? How is it done? Who does it? Um, what sorts of things will you look at and what will you not look at? Um, you know, is, is there a policy for it or is it just however, whoever wants to do it is how it's done, right? Like looking at things through um, the lens of, ensuring that survivors are comfortable within your program to talk about substance use with any of the advocates or, or counselors or therapists or anyone that they might be working with. You can go to the next one and I believe we're back to you. Yes, thank you. Um, and so here, I wanna have some real talk about the use of breathalyzers and drug screenings. So a lot of times when programs are using these, they, um, so hopefully we know that they're actually not aligned with federal regulations. Um, and so we actually are in violation of federal regulations if we are using breathalyzers and drug screenings at any point. So if your program finds itself still using this, some things that you can reflect on is, you know, when did we start using this kind of drug screening? What do we think it's gonna solve for us? What assumptions are we basing the use of drug screening on? Because something that, um, that actually, you know, I wanna share with folks is that a drug test does not tell us if a person has a substance use disorder. 
And as you saw, um, the vast majority of people who use a substance do not actually have a substance use disorder. Um, it doesn't tell us whether somebody's going to experience a crisis. It just it doesn't do that, right? Um, and somebody could actually have a substance use disorder and still not have any substances in their system, right? That substances don't, not all substances stay in our system or are detectable in our system for more than a few days. And so, and in substance use disorder programs that uh, I can tell you, I ran substance use disorder programs and never involuntarily drug tested people ever, not one time in the thousands of people who came through my program. Um, and even in substance use disorder treatment, where this is considered, uh, you know, a legal practice, um, still, it is known that best practices does not include limiting somebody's access to the services that they need based on the results of a substance use screening. And so we have to really have a right-sized approach here that when we are asking somebody to, you know, blow through a tube, when we're asking somebody to pee in a cup, whether or not we like it, this is actually what we're saying to people. I don't believe what you say to me. You need to give me something from your body in order for me to verify what you say to me. And that depending on what this either bodily fluid or what your breath tells me, because I don't believe you, that's what I'm going to make decisions about your safety and access to services based on. I don't think those are messages that come from our heart. I don't think those are messages that we want any survivor to ever feel in any of our programs. That's not healing, right? And so if this is a practice that for whatever reason your program is using, this is an opportunity to really look critically at that practice and try something new. Back to you, Katie. So now we're going to look at shifting from our staff, you, you, the program, you know, advocates, shelter workers, whatever you might call them, in a position of rule enforcement to coming alongside as a collaborator with the survivor in a partnership to move forward, you know, toward their goals. Um, so we've talked about this a little bit already, minimizing program rules, not making reactionary rules or policies that are based in one-time incidences, instead individualized approaches. Um, make sure that rules have reasonings that relate back to safety. And we say safety here, we're talking about survivor safety, not like the program's idea of safety. So keep that in mind. Anytime that we've talked about safety, we're always referencing survivor safety, not the program's idea of safety because they are not always the same thing, right? So um, I remember, you know, back in the day uh, before, you know, domestic violence programs nationwide sort of started limiting rules, there would be very like restrictive rules that were I, I like were defended with the idea of safety, but it was rooted in a safety that wasn't realistic. So um, the one that said the curfew was 8 p.m. because it gets dark after 8 p.m. And that was the, but did anyone ask the survivor, do you feel unsafe after 8 p.m. outside? Nope, okay, cool, right? So um, keep in mind that you're talking about survivor safety. Any invasive practice that can possibly be avoided is avoided. Um, consequences associated with substance use are not artificially imposed by the program. So whatever the consequence might be, um, you wanna make sure that that's not just imposed however, whoever wants it to be, which we've referenced that before, right? Individualized approaches. Um, behaviors that pose safety concerns are approached with empathy rather than a threat that you will lose your housing over this, right? We never wanna hold housing over someone. Um, and, and the participants themselves are invited to participate in these conversations. What, and I, I distinctly remember this one time as, as a very big learning experience for me. I was at the shelter and I was having a conversation with the manager of the shelter at the time in front of, you know, with, with some participants that were living in the shelter. And I kept saying, you know, the part that worries me the most about our property is the backyard, like, cause that's where the survivors would go to smoke, to hang out. It's where the playground is for the kids, but it's very dark and it leads, it's right next to an alley. Um, that is also very dark. So I was like, the lighting is a problem, but 
I also don't want to like, you know, light up the whole, the whole world when sometimes people like, you know, the twilight darkness, whatever. And one of the survivors was like, why don't you just get motion censored lights? And I was like, well, why don't we? Um, and it was such a radical idea, but she was like, yeah, I thought about it the last time I was out here that that would be nice to have. So even just incorporating them in conversations around, you know, how pr the program is structured, what things look like can be very helpful. All right, you can move on to the next one. And then this is a common question and it's come up here today as well. So how do we support survivors who use substances while also maintaining safety in our programs? So first understanding that our programs are safer when we can openly talk about substance use and when the rules are minimized so that they're actually the rules are we can remember them, <laughs> that they feel realistic. It's not just like, oh, another set of rules meant to be broken, but that they're actually realistic and they make sense um, and that they're simplified so that I, I actually feel like I have a chance at, um, at being able to be in this space and contribute to the safety of the space. And what we have heard time and time again from programs is that when they go through this process, that their program becomes safer. That when people understand those clear limits and that those limits are based on, you know, community safety and not based on power struggles and not based on abstinence only, that then um, their programs actually become safer. And so there's also a common question that comes up here around, um, you know, what do I do when other people in the space are feeling maybe um, like they have, uh, they're in recovery and not using any substances and now they're having some craving experiences um, because they think someone else is using um, or that other person maybe has even invited them to use or something like that. So something that can be helpful there is that we want to really individualize that support. Um, I remember working with a survivor who at first when the program changed some of the policies, you know, she came to staff and she was really upset. And she was saying, you know, I had to be sober in order to be here. Now people don't. What's going on? I don't feel safe, right? Um, very, very understandable responses. And so we asked her, you know, um, what would feel supportive? What would, what would help you feel supported? Um, there are lots of different situations that might lead someone to to feel a craving. What are some of the skills they use? Who are some of the supports that they go to? And one of the things that this survivor shared with us that it would be really helpful to be able to talk, to meet with staff and talk about how she was feeling. Um, and that, that it would be really helpful to have a group on site for people who are in more of that kind of recovery maintenance phase. Um, so to have kind of that peer support. And then she also said that she was gonna talk to her mutual aid sponsor. And then when she came back and chatted with us afterwards, she shared that her sponsor had said to her, you know, I have to walk past a liquor store, liquor store every day on my way to work. You know, part of life is gonna be navigating some of these different things that are triggers. And so in this situation, let's make a plan for how we can really support you in this moment, right? And so we always wanna individualize that support, but that doesn't mean, you know, sacrificing one person over another. And that certainly doesn't mean cutting off our programming, um, but that's not a solution. At the end of the day, we need to also have support and the safety to learn how to manage our triggers and our cravings to use. That's part of the reality, right? And I see that we have two minutes left. Um, and I know that there's a lot of questions around supporting parenting and children's well-being. I also know that we're not going to have time to have this conversation in a way that is meaningful. And so potentially a future topic could maybe only focus on parenting and children's well-being when there is substance use. If that's something that um, this group would find helpful, um, and so just want to just want to name that reality that we are at the end of our time. So with that, I do want to just um, 
you know, we don't have time to go back to the jam board, but hopefully folks have the opportunity to check that out. And we can also share that with uh, people, a PDF of it, when we share the slides and the other handouts. And that could be a great idea to get some ideas, a great place to get ideas for moving forward with your own practice. Absolutely. Katie, so if you want to summarize our takeaways and then we'll turn it back over to Carrie. Yes, this will be the fastest summary you've ever seen. Um, so these are our reminders moving forward, our, our kind of steps to work on, right? Survivor defined needs and solutions, keeping survivors involved in decisions of the program, um, recognizing how substance use concerns are linked to surviving human trafficking and trauma. We talked about that. Um, matter of fact approach to substance use, helping survivors safety plan and mitigate potential harms, including those that are in recovery that are referencing feeling triggers or, or the need to use within the program. Meeting the person where they are, having a no wrong door approach, however they got to you, however they get to programs is, is, is great and resilient and strong. Um, and collaborating with substance use resources in your, in your area. If you don't know what they are, look them up, call them, meet with them, see what they can do, see how they can help. You might be surprised at how many programs can come to you and don't necessarily require survivors to travel. Awesome. Um, Gabriella, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we kind of wrap things up? No, go ahead and wrap okay. up. Just, well, I'll say thank you. Thank you everyone for coming today and thank you for having us. Awesome. Thank you, Katie and Gabriella, for all the amazing content information, review of practical implementation um, of this intersection of substance use and housing for our uh, housing and trafficking survivors. Um, I just wanted to echo the conversation of parenting as well in this conversation. Uh, we would love to, you know, bring back a part two of that intersection as well with parenting and substance use. Um, so definitely thank you again to our presenters. Thank you all who attended. Um, just to kind of reiterate a recording of this webinar as well as the slides, a Q&A document will also be available just to be mindful of time for everyone. So we will come back to those questions that were shared for our presenters. And then we also have a survey link that was shared in the chat. Uh, we would love your all's feedback on this and thank you very much for attending. Have a great rest of your evening, y'all.